<laughs> Wake up in the morning, get my grind on. Hop in the shower, brush my teeth, and get my shine on. Hey, Skylar Mac, we taking trips to different time zones. I feel like E.T. Way, these bitches trying to find home. Wake up in the morning, get my grind on. Welcome everybody to Living on Purpose podcast. We're your host James Hagler and myself Jason Wilson. Today we have a special guest, Jonathan Hyder. He's a Paralympic swimmer, architect, and motivational speaker. Welcome to the show. Hey, thank you. Nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, oh you're welcome. Thank you very much. So, Jonathan, what was your childhood dream? So. Yeah, so starting from the very beginning, I start with my childhood. I was born in Croatia and I was adopted at 16 months old and came to the U.S. I was born a quad amputee. So growing up, I was this high energy kid in definite need of an outlet. And so, uh, you know, trying to find kind of what kind of would be that dream. What is that kind of like you said, uh, that purpose? What is my childhood dream? Um, you know, just kind of getting into a bunch of different things. Um, I love designing and I loved you know, being active. And so I wanted, you know, it, it achieve like a, athleticism and also something that uh, dealt with some form of designing in some shape or form. So tell me something. So um, when they, when you was active, like is very active as, as a little kid, did it drive your mother and father crazy? <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, I mean, they <laughs> found out that, wait a minute, something's wrong with him. He saw the sugar kick and he ain't had no sugar. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's exactly it. It was like, I was so high on life, you know, and I didn't need no sugar or anything. I was about the walls as is. What yeah. But, you know. Well, I was going to say, the reason yeah. why I asked, because my little brother was the same way. I mean, I mean, I mean, Champ, Marvin Jr., Oh my God, he was, he drove my dad crazy. <laughs> I mean, he would jump off. I'm serious. He, the boy was just jumping off, off of this, off of that, jumping on the TV. My, I remember one time we sitting down in the living room and we're watching TV. My dad's trying to take a nap before he go to the gym. So he tells my brother, hey, stop bouncing about, sit down. And we're watching TV. We're, we're just watching champs just going everywhere. So champs are on the windowsill. And he's on the windsill. He's walking across the windowsill. Then he jumps from the windowsill to the TV. And then he jumps down. <laughs> so my dad was still, my dad was faking like he was asleep. He did it again. And then when he jumped on off the TV, my dad tried to grab him. Champ was just too fast. Jumped up over him like a football player. Ran upstairs. My dad ran after him. And they just couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. So they took him to the doctors. And the doctor said he's just overactive. You have right. to put them in some type of sport, and they put them in gymnastics, and okay, that, solved right the, that solved the the problem because he was he was just too much to for, to, uh, to be at home not doing nothing. <laughs> oh, I and I absolutely and I get that. That was the same situation with me as well. I tried every disabled sport imaginable from you know wheelchair basketball, wheelchair rugby, wheelchair tennis, sled hockey, you know, swimming, sitting volleyball. I, I did it all. Just to get that, you know, energy outlet. Yeah, totally, totally the same situation growing up. Oh, totally relatable. Yeah, I got, that's why I laugh when people tell me that that's how they were. Because the first thing I think about is the parents. Because the parents don't, they, right. I mean, they lose their mind. They don't know. They like, what's wrong with them? What's wrong? <laughs> right exactly and that's the thing it's not even the sugar it's just as is yeah, right yeah, definitely so i get a kick out of that when somebody tells me that <laughs> so jonathan uh what was your favorite sport as a child um participation wise so the one that stuck was swimming i mean that's the one that took me to the world stage as a paralympic swimmer um there were other sports that i enjoyed playing as well I definitely enjoyed sitting volleyball. I definitely enjoyed sled hockey as well. And so, I, I mean, I enjoyed, you know, trying them all, but I guess those were kind of the top three that I enjoyed participating in with different uh, friends and groups around the country. How come swimming? What, what stood out about swimming the most? So one of the things for me is I don't like or never have, like, having any form of like extensions or any extra equipment and that was the one thing that was so incredible in the disabled sports world with swimming is you're not allowed to have any extra stuff um you know you're it's just literally swimsuit and goggles and that's all you're allowed to have whereas like 
with like sitting volleyball, you know, you have your special prosthetic arm, your special prosthetic leg right. that you wear when you play or any of the wheelchair sports, you know, every single wheelchair sport has its own chair. You know, wheelchair rugby right. chair is completely different than a racing chair is completely different than a basketball chair is completely than a tennis chair. And I just love that freedom that I could just be me, my own body and have that freedom without any form of extra equipment or accessories that I had to wear to help me be a better it was just simply relying on my own body and my own strengths to be successful and that's what swimming gave me that independence that i could be successful without any form of adaptations i i, I would have to agree with you i would i, I would the same way i would be the same way no doubt that's why i excuse me that's why i wanted to ask that question because i was curious because that's 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 what i would i would do you know same thing i get it absolutely yeah Jonathan, did you experience any type of uh, unfair treatment or anything like that um, when you were a young adult with your disability? Well, I think a lot of the times people were concerned over like everything that would need to be made, anything kind of that difference. And so like there was kind of that view of, you know, to accommodate me, you know, the hoops that they would have to go through, like the obstacles that were needed for them to accommodate for me, whether that was in a job situation or whether I was going to participate in a group activity or a networking group or making sure, okay, can he get in the door? Can he do this? Can he do that? And I just advocating for myself, you know, I, I teach them like, Hey, I, I can do this job just fine. I don't need, you know, all this extra equipment or I don't need all this extra stuff um, to be successful in this job. And so there was almost kind of like that stigmatism of like, in order to be successful, they needed to do a bunch of stuff for me. And that wasn't the case. And so definitely dealt with kind of that kind of um, obstacle at first. Okay. The reason I asked that, man, is because um, in this past Super Bowl, did you see the game? I did. I watched a little bit of it. Yeah. Okay. I read an article um, after the Super Bowl was over that, you know, there were two deaf musicians that participated in the Super Bowl and uh, there was like a separate app that they had to download in, in order to, um, you know, be accessible uh, to the Super Bowl. And a lot of people thought that that situation was really, really unfair. I know that you're passionate about helping the disabled <clears throat> as well. How did you feel about that situation? I think understanding your limitation and understanding what's necessary for you. I mean, there are hoops that I have to jump through as well with certain situations that I know, like, it's just, it's just part of life. And it's something that I've come to accept um, with being born with the disability that I have. I understand where my limitations are and what I have to do to overcome them. And so, you know, that, yeah, there's situations that I've been in, not quite that exact situation, but where you might have to kind of go around a different way or download a special app or do this or do that or go through a different entryway to get into a space or whatever it may be. But that's just, you know, the cards that are dealt, you know, that's the, the game that you're playing. And so everybody's trying to play the same game, but they're given kind of a different set of rules and how to accomplish it. Uh, but I think in the end, we all get there. And so it's disappointing that, you know, we still have to jump through some of these hoops, but like it is what it is. And that's how we will overcome it is um, at least they are there, you know, looking back, you know, in this situation, like, you know, people with disabilities, you know, using this example with uh, people who are hard of hearing or deaf is that this didn't exist before. You know, these apps didn't exist five, six years ago. And so I'm grateful that we're at least making the strides to allow them to at least try to be on the same level. Um, and situations like that for myself, that there were things that were not readily available when I was a child that are more available now to equal the playing field for everyone. That's an interesting point. So what types of things um, did you experience uh, not having access to when you were a child that exists now? Yeah. Um, oh, that is a good question. I think technology as a whole, uh, you know, I talk about how uh, I was an architectural designer, got my degrees in architecture and all of that. I would not have been able to pursue an architecture degree if it wasn't for everything being done electronic now that it is today, as opposed to people who were architects, you know, 15, 20 years ago, they were all doing stuff by hand and drafting things by hand. And that's not something that I myself am able to do. And so having that technology available opens professions like to be an architect that I wasn't able to pursue um, 
previously. And so technology has allowed me to open the doors like so, um, you know, by using uh, programs and electronics to be able to um, be on the same level and do the same exact stuff and have the same level of craftsmanship and quality as people who are not disabled. Oh, no doubt. I like the fact that technology is just, just making your guys' world a whole lot better. I mean, I mean, even with just some of the prosthetic limbs, um, I want to ask, I want to ask you, I want to talk to you about this. Um, this, is, this happened a while ago about a guy, sure. that, a guy that had the prosthetic leg. They put him in the race with everybody and he won the race. And then they said that he had the event and they took the race <laughs> away from him. The comedian Cat William did a segment on that and we were just blown away. I remember watching that on the news, just blown away by that. I thought that was just unfair and, and, and injustice. I didn't like that. Because I mean, he won the race. Okay, he won the race. Why are you gonna get mad at him? Because <laughs> you know what I'm saying. <laughs> that, was, that was crazy. They took the they took the medal away from him. You know what I'm saying? That, that was that was bad, man. I didn't like that at all. I thought that was, I would have been pissed. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think it's it's. I, I I think it's tough in those situations because you know, like you want to make sure that it is a level playing field for everyone, and like. That whole situation, like, it's such a toss up in my own mind because, like, here he is, you know, racing with his peers. You know, you want to be out there with them. And, like, you know, you think, okay, because he's got this disability, he's, he's not good enough for them. Well, in fact, he, if not only good <laughs> enough, but he <laughs> surpasses them. <laughs> and so it's it's tough. And so, you know, what is what is equal? What is, you know, you don't want to, you know, go into such a big argument of, well, you know, you you should only be amongst people who are also disabled. Well, is right, that right, fair? Right, you know? right, and right. so it's it's a tough thing to call because you don't really, you know, I don't think we've established that. Um, we're still learning those fields, especially you know in the Paralympic world and uh, athletics in general. There's a lot of there's a lot of things that still need to be established as far as what are the standards. You know, does is this particular athlete was he at an advantage? Or was he simply just put into a situation where he was able to compete with others? And so well, Cat, it's a Cat tough William, call. Cat, Cat Williams said he didn't have a leg. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody else got legs. He he had he had his prosthetic leg. I mean, we mean who got the, who's at disadvantage there? Right. Well, and that's I mean, exactly, it ain't like yeah, he's the bionic you know. man or something. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> But it was still his own strength. You know, it wasn't the legs walking for him. Yeah, was, and so, it, exactly. and that's the thing is he was still, it was still his exactly. own legs that were making it happen, you know, just, and so it, it's tough. And I think, you know, I trust the Paralympics and all of the different, um, you know, you, uh, the U.S. Uh, Track and Field Association, the USOC, the IOC, International Olympic Committee to establish these standards and make it fair for everyone who's competing. And right. I'm glad that, you know, technology has advanced to that point that, you know, I think that's super cool and incredible that we're at that point with the technology that you can have the prosthetic legs that can help you become one of the greatest athletes like that. Absolutely. I agree too. So Jonathan, um, with your architecture degree, um, what, what, what would you like to accomplish with that? I've always been about trailblazing. Um, you know, this whole podcast is on living your purpose and my biggest thing is advocacy. Um, and so, um, you know, as someone who's disabled and grew up in a situation and I grew up right around when the EDA Act was put into place is I want to make things more accessible and equal for all users. And that was the biggest thing about getting my degrees in architecture. I love designing, but the biggest thing is to make sure that nobody has to go through the same obstacles, the same BS that I went through um, to get through spaces that I don't want someone, you know, for example, one of the biggest things that was my thesis in college um, is the sequence of spaces that I want everybody to experience the same way of entering a building. You know, I don't want somebody who's able-bodied to be able to go up a grand flight of steps into this beautiful lobby, or someone like myself who had in the past um, in a wheelchair has to go up the, the ramp in the back end of the building that's not lit at all where the dumpsters live and have to navigate the dark, depressing hallways to get through space. And so that is my biggest thing when it comes to architecture is creating an accessible and inclusive um, environment for everyone to be able to utilize the space in the same way. Mm, that's interesting. So where you live right now, do you find that most buildings are accessible or, or they're not? I think we're changing. Um, a lot of 
where I live. So I live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And so there's a lot of older buildings um, that exist here. And so a lot of the older ones still, you know, still unfortunately kind of going through the back alleys to get through the back door. But um, it's it's changing. And I know that there's a lot of incredible uh, laws and codes in place now that all new construction have to follow. Um, and those are allowing them the more inclusive environments that are more open friendly. And a lot of the new constructions that have been going up have been absolutely incredible and in allowing kind of equal access for all users, regardless of their abilities. That's good. So tell us about your motivational speaking. Yeah, so I have been a public speaker for about 10 years now. I started when I was living out at the Olympic and Paralympic Training Center in Colorado Springs, Colorado for about two and a half years, advocating on behalf of the Paralympics, um, later signed with an agency, and then just most recently in uh, 2021 went independent with my own business, Switzstar. Um, my whole thing is uh, focused on diversity and inclusion, but also mental health and advocation. Um, my biggest thing is on understanding the components of you and wake, what makes up yourself um, and using what you've got as the assets to yourself to look within rather than to look without. And so focusing in on how can you beat the odds that are in front of you, utilizing the skills that you are have already as opposed to looking outside and saying, well, I, you know, maybe if I have that, maybe if I have that, no, utilizing what you have already and switching that mindset from cannot to can. Um, so, yeah. Um, you know, there, there's so much um, going around the media with mental health issues and athletes. Um, do you see the same in the Paralympic community or? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. If, you know, I would say if not more, but I think there's a lot more you know, to overcome with the, the Paralympics because you have this disability that you've already overcome yourself and you've got to kind of then prepare yourself <laughs> in the same way that other athletes um, you know, as the Olympic Olympian athletes are going through, but then you have this added pressure and the stress and the, you know, we worry about, you know, equipment breaking with, a, you know, as we're watching the Olympics now of like a ski pole breaking. Well, that's not a big deal. You can always get a replacement ski pole. You know, you talk about with Paralympics, like, you know, their the prosthetic leg breaks, you know, that's not something you can just go get off the shelf. And so there's a lot of undue stress and undue, you know, mental anxiety that happens um, that, you know, what if, you know, you're traveling to the Olympic or, or to the Paralympic Games and the airport, you know, screws up your wheelchair and breaks the, the wheel. You know, that's 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 undue hardship right there that, you know, completely mentally, you know, messes with you that you never saw happening. And so there's a lot of additional um, mental stress that's added at the Paralympic level and even just disabled sports as a whole um, that most able-bodied people never have to worry about because it's just simply them and they don't have the equipment to have to worry about in the same capacity. No doubt. Plus, plus you, you guys already fought this war before, you know what I'm saying? So I would think you guys will uh, be more prepared for any, any other thing outside of that, to, you know, to really bother you because you know what it takes to be strong and have to uh, push through to make yourself, you know, to make yourself better. <clears throat> Well, absolutely. I mean, there's that. And, you know, and I think the thing is, I think as Paralympians, in a way, when it comes to mental health, you're already used to rolling with the punches, exactly. as you kind of mentioned there. But it's just like more things to roll with the punches, more things that you're used to dealing with this. Now you have to deal with additional. And so it's like, it's just like the added what... stress to the stress that you already have. No, no, yeah, I think absolutely. it would be a little bit easier because you know how to fight. You know what I'm saying? Right. Opposed, oh, absolutely. Opposed to somebody that doesn't does, doesn't know how to fight, but they, you know, they they in for a long fight. You know, so, uh, you know, that's mm -hmm. that's what I was saying. Like you saying about you know prosthetic limbs breaking down or a wheelchair, but that's when you got to bring two. That's when you got to you know, because <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, Serena. It's like the tennis player, like Serena's Williams. She don't got one tennis racket. You know what I'm saying? She got about four or five in there just in case one of the strings busts, because one of the strings busts, that's just a wrap, you know? Right. Well, but but the thing is, you know, it's most people don't have, you know, the multiple chairs. I mean, a typical, exactly. you know, you're talking tennis, a wheelchair tennis chair, you know, that's $20,000 a chair. You know, right. that's not, you know, something where you can go quick pick up another $40 racket. True. And so, yeah, but absolutely, yeah, used to rolling with the punches. You know, definitely, you know, know to how to overcome a hell of a lot better than, you know, most, you know, athletes as a whole, because we were used to it. Absolutely. I get right. that point. Yeah, because if I was in a wheelchair and I was playing sports, 
I, that would be my concern. That you know, I would be stressed over that because I'd be like, look, man, I just this can't I can't have his wheelchair mess it up. So look, can we get another wheelchair? Well, James, that's twenty thirty thousand dollars. Well, we need a sponsor, <laughs> right? <laughs> Cause I'm not going through this. This is what I'm in the Olympics. You know, th these things don't come around every every year. It's like every four years. You know, let's 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 make sure we cover all our bases. I, yeah, I, that would be one of the first things I would be stressed out about. I don't think anything else would stress me out more than making sure that everything is working properly. Make sure that there's no problems. That would I could see where that would drive uh, you guys crazy, man. You know what I'm saying? That that that's that that alone is enough to. To give you mental stress, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all part of the game, though. You know, yeah, it's yeah. it's what you sign up for, though. Yeah. And you you know that this is just it's part yeah, of the you, game. You know what you're getting into. You know, what I'm saying so right. you, you try to beat it, and that's probably that's one of the ways that I would try to beat it. You know, and God forbid that anything would ever happen where you know something did break down. It's as serious as that, where you wouldn't be able to compete. You know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Jonathan, uh, do a lot of companies sponsor Paralympic athletes? Is that something that's that's readily available? That is something that's been coming out a lot more. I was active in the Paralympics through 2008 to 2012, and there wasn't a whole lot then. But you look at some of the top um, notch athletes now, they've got sponsors all over the world, you know, now and some massive sponsors as well. You see a lot of, you know, watching the Super Bowl recently, you know, all these sponsors are sponsoring not only Olympic athletes, but Paralympic athletes as well. Last Super Bowl, my teammate, uh, Jessica Long, had, she's sponsored by Toyota, and she was in the Super Bowl, um, you know, commercial then. So it's coming around a lot better now, and it's getting a lot more recognition. It's a lot more in the spotlight here in the United States than it was in the past. So Sponsorships are definitely starting to come around for Paralympic athletes in recent years. That's great. That's great. It shouldn't have took this long. It shouldn't, but it's here now. And it was a fight and uphill battle, but we're starting to kind of see um, Paralympians recognize equally. Um, 2020 was the first time where um, Paralympic athletes were paid the same amount as Olympic athletes. That was the first time in Olympic history. Um, you know, why, why did it take that long? You know, that's crazy to think that it took that long, but we've made it and we're finally here. And so uh, celebrating those accomplishments. That's right. You won. That's you great. That's great. Jonathan, tell us about your company, Split Star. So, yeah. So Split Star is my, uh, public speaking, keynote speaking, workshop facilitation and business coaching business. Um, it came from kind of the background of who I am, this kind of, uh, so I was, like I said, I was born in Croatia. I was born in the city of Split. So that's where Split comes from. Um, and then also kind of this rags to riches of coming from an orphanage and making it and being successful as a Paralympian architectural designer and keynote speaker here in the States um, and making myself a star now. And so I work on um, creating uh, really great inclusive programs for businesses, medium to large nonprofits, colleges and universities that are looking to create uh, a more inclusive culture within their environment and really make that change for the better to help people of different backgrounds um, become more um, individualized and become successful within the business themselves. That's great. But what do you like to Thank do you. for fun? <laughs> I, you know, I enjoy just kicking it. I enjoy getting out and about. I love going out to eat. I love kind of, I love sports. I still am uh, heavy into sports. So enjoy going to sports games, enjoy watching sports and just hanging out with friends and family um, around town. So, yeah, absolutely. So you said Midwest, that's where you're from, right? That is correct. Yeah, I'm in Milwaukee, oh, Wisconsin. Oh, Mid yep. Milwaukee, okay. Because I stayed in Fargo. <clears throat> Oh, okay. Dakota. It ain't like it's cold up there, man. <laughs> it does. It's yeah, like two, it's like two winters up there. You know what I'm saying? Because you got to go through that forty below. The, the the thing is this: what I learned. I remember I got there. It was in February, I think it was, <clears throat> and I had just came from Atlanta. So I'm looking at it's like thirty six degrees, thirty degrees, and I'm looking at everybody. They walking around and. Shorts, short, short <laughs> I'm, like, man, I'm all leathered up with the scarf and the scully, and I'm like, man, these these people are crazy little kids. I was like, man, they're gonna catch, they're gonna catch cold. And then I didn't understand it until the next winter. And the next winter came around, we got snow in October, oh, right, wow. right after Halloween. 
So right. that wow. snow, that that snow stayed <laughs> until May. <laughs> it, it, like, it, it did it did it and then when the cold air hits there's no rain only snow and i was like wow man then then i got used to because we hit that 40 below and once it got 30 man it felt like summertime <laughs> right well and that's exactly it it's, that's exactly it yeah no yeah, i feel yeah. that yeah it just i liked it, it out there after i um after i got you know after the culture shock, after I got used to it, but I couldn't stand it. It just took too long to warm up. Too yeah. Long. Once it warm up, then it gets cold again. I wouldn't like. I didn't. Right. Like that. Right. Didn't long like winters. That. Yeah. 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 I need a couple more months. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan, at this point of your life, um, are you living in your purpose? I am. You know, I, I think, you know, throughout my whole life, I felt like, you know, here I am, this jack of all trades. Like I keep jumping around from, you know, being a Paralympic athlete to an architectural designer to a keynote speaker. But throughout this whole time, I've been confident that I have been living my purpose the entire time and having that time to reflect um, that my whole point in my whole life um, and my purpose as to um, pave the way for others to advocate on behalf of people whose voices aren't heard or people who don't want to speak up but need to speak up or don't feel comfortable speaking up that I'm there to be the advocate for them and to be kind of that liaison to help them out so they don't have to go through half the obstacles of feeling um, disincluded feeling um, excluded and not part of the community feeling on the outside looking in I want to make sure nobody has to go through that same way and so I did that as a Paralympic athlete. I did that as an architectural designer, and I continue to do that today as a keynote speaker and workshop facilitator. Absolutely. That's phenomenal. What's a final thought that you have to leave our viewers with? I think, you know, always continue to look within and reflect on where you've gotten. I think that is some of the biggest things that um, people struggle, especially in today's society. We're always looking to the next thing. We're always you know, looking at the next obstacle is kind of taking that moment to look back on the obstacles that we have already overcome to get to where we are and how we've overcome those obstacles were not external factors. They were relying on the components that make up who you are to get to where you are today um, and how important that is to reflect on those components of you um, because you are successful in your own way and you have gotten to where you are. And so take that time to pause and reflect on what you've overcome and what you've used within yourself to overcome those obstacles. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, how Thank can you. People, yes, how can people find you on social media? Yeah, so my business is um, Split Star. Um, the website is split-star.com. Otherwise you can find it on Instagram, um, LinkedIn and Facebook at just Split Star. Um, so, um, any of those can be found there. And then on my website, I've got contact information on there as well. Okay, great. Jonathan, thank you so much for being on our show. We really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for watching living on purpose podcast, subscribe to our YouTube channel.